What's your goal here? Preserve democracy for the digital era. Welcome to Human Centered, a series of short conversations with researchers at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. The center was founded in 1954 to encourage interdisciplinary research focused on the most pressing societal issues of our time. Each year, a range of scholars, scientists, and government officials come to spend a year studying contemporary societal problems. My name is John Markoff. I'm a science and technology writer and former reporter for the New York Times. In these conversations, we've set out to find interesting projects at the center that shed new light on the way we think about society. Today I spoke with Thomas Hendrik Ilves, the former president of Estonia, who this year is a Begruen Fellow at the center. He has been focused on regulatory changes and technologies necessary to ensure the survival of liberal democracies. Ilves is a frequent advisor to governments around the globe who are trying to emulate some of the advances that Estonia has made in digital governance. We spoke about the challenges that internet technologies have created and their impact on the United States and democracies around the world. What is the project you're working on? Well, I'll talk about how I got there, which was that uh, I was already worried about uh, the use of the internet or of digital technology to manipulate elections for about a decade. But in 2016, it became very clear, and I was one of the first people to actually write anything about it. nothing big, just like saying, "Hi guys, this is you know this is going on." And then I've spent the time since I got to Stanford in 2017 basically researching everything that has been has gone on and what can be done to mitigate these problems. And sort of sitting up here, looking across the bay, it struck me one day that in fact you can tinker and you can come up with maybe new algorithms to fight you know, deep fakes, or you can, you can do something to identify fake news, or you can, you can find something to identify bots, but it'll always be Achilles running after the tortoise, and you will never catch up, and that really the fundamental problems we face are the vulnerabilities in democracy, the way we've practiced it since basically the 18th century, uh, that there are certain weaknesses that need to be fixed. Now, The most uh, sort of glaring one, I'd say, which is here in the United States, is the Electoral College, where you can actually focus on certain key states because of the disproportionality or disproportional weight and this way have a maximum effect. But more broadly, it's not just that, which is strictly a U.S. thing. Uh, I think that first past the post-electoral systems were also known as single mandate electoral district. A congressional district and whoever wins, wins. That leads to several things which increase the possibilities for manipulation and also for polarization. Uh, I mean, first of all, a first past the post electoral system, as you have, say, in the US and in the UK, leads to a two party system. The two-party system leads to a middle ground that is more away from the center than you would expect, as opposed to what you have in most countries in Europe, which is a multiple mandate electoral district. And there you have, I mean, you say you have a district electoral, a state, for example, and you have, you may have 100 people running, but five of them win. But generally, what you'll end up having is kind of the centrist will win, and you'll also have some outliers, either on the far left or the far right, maybe. But no single party in that kind of system ever wins, or very rarely do you have a situation where one party wins, gets over 50%, which then leads to a coalition. This leads to politics in Europe that is more centrist-oriented, less divided, um, you can look at, I mean, if you, where, where are the divisions the greatest right now? It's the U.S. and at uh, the U.K. right now, where you have this, this complete sort of I mean, breakdown, where you have, this, on the, in the case of Brexit and, the, and the, leave, the Remain and the Leave people, I mean, they're not talking to each other at all, and you just have this huge chasm. Now, 
that's another example of where you're more susceptible to propaganda than you are if you have a multiple mandate electoral jurisdiction. But in the case of Brexit, it was a referendum that did it. And again, referenda, where you have binary decisions, uh, you are very susceptible to outside interference. And so you, we are only now finding out, and with uh, sort of tremendous reluctance on the part of the authorities, that of the amount of manipulation that went into the Brexit uh, referendum with not only the lies about its effects spread by people running or who were leading it officially, but uh, the amount of uh, sort of sub-Rosa manipulation that went on on the part of Russians buying ads or paying or sort of manipulating people to buy ads. I mean, there are people who were buying ads, probably with, I mean, not being transparent about it, but at least they were UK citizens, but apparently they were offered deals for like draw diamond mines. We saw actually where it really sort of came full force was in 2014 with uh, the Ukrainian, the, well, the, the, even before uh, the actual toppling of Yanukovych. I mean, you saw this narrative being pushed uh, about you know the Ukrainian fascists, and you had fake videos that were supposedly news that were these were taken up by a rather naive Western journalist. So you had these, uh, I mean, stories about, you know, sort of Ukraine is supposedly sort of crucifying a Russian child with this, I mean, it turned out it was an actress. And uh, especially the BBC was very much said, well, on the one hand, the, the Russians say this, on the other hand, the Ukrainians deny it. And this naivete with regard to Russian media reportage did a huge amount of damage for the Ukrainians back then. I mean, now, you know, five years later, even a couple of years afterwards, news sources have become more sophisticated. I mean, that's also different from what is posted on Facebook. That remains the same, but at least the Western news outlets have become a little more skeptical with regard to these things and don't report them as, as if it were all true. So that's why I've been yeah. dealing with it for a while. And, yeah. of course, the, the full panoply of possibilities became apparent in 2016. Everything from hacking to doxing, the publishing the materials that had been hacked, to the manipulation of news, fake news. I mean, I, the word I don't like, but basically using... Um, pseudo uh, journalistic outlets yeah. maybe from sort of Macedonia. Did, did you get an inkling of any of this in Estonia? You said you'd written about this early on and was it from uh, things that were happening in the digital world in Estonia that alerted you to that? Well, we had the uh, we had the massive DDoS attack in 2007 remember. which uh, I say usually that well this is the first sort of uh, first case of outright cyber war in a sense because it was the continuation of policy by other means. In order to pay back Estonia for moving a statue, they did a massive DDoS attack against us. And that was actually the first time I said, well, I mean, you can in fact use this for political ends. And then... Do you see any of the steps that Estonia has taken to have inerted against some of these things? Well, some do. First of all, in my country, since the beginning, you cannot transfer property with an anonymous, you cannot be an anonymous shell company. And that's been there since basically 1991. But it is also one of the three transactions you cannot perform digitally. You have to show up for that. So getting married, you have to show up. You have to show up if you get divorced. And the third is you have to have a member of a identifiable, real company show up if you're going to buy or sell property. And we did it for completely different reasons back in the early 90s because we said, okay, we're poor, we're little, and like, you know, you could just buy up, you know, neighbor to the east is going to buy everything up. But now, looking at, say, the UK, US, Trump Tower, 
I mean, these, all these properties you can buy in all these countries. I mean, the UK is the same, a huge problem. And then it turns out that the children of various authoritarians in not only Russia but other authoritarians in the former Soviet Union are you know they're all you know they're living in London. You know? yeah. 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 So that's one thing. Uh, is clearly, uh, we have. I mean, our system is ultimately based on a on having a strong digital identity, and that gives you a lot of security. I mean, it doesn't work against the fake news stuff, but. In terms of making an efficient governance system, you really do need a strong digital identity with you know, end-to-end encryption, two-factor authentication. You can sign documents digitally, legally, and it has legal force. To this issue of democracy and technology, do you find yourself able to remain optimistic? Uh, cautiously. I'm optimistic in the sense that, uh, that we will find a way to deal with these issues because there is nothing sh- short of a around-the-world electromagnetic pulse that is going to stop this. Yeah. Uh, and there will be enough people with Faraday cages uh, around their computers. <laughs> we will have to deal with this. And I, that's why I've come to the conclusion that we need to, in one way or another, uh, address the uh, vulnerabilities of democracy uh, or democratic procedures that were from the 18th century. I mean, the Electoral College was designed that way, if you read the Federalist Papers, I mean, basically to make sure that three big states, Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania, didn't dominate the process. Uh, whereas that's, you know, we're living in an era in which, you know, Presidential candidates they just fly out, fly back. I mean, everyone gets everyone gets to see the candidates, and it's all. Uh, and we live in instant communication. You know, I've seen there's this movement, a winner take all movement, that would sort of minimize the electoral college impact. Do you think that's uh, how fixable? Do you think the electoral college? Ultimately, I think that there's enough uh, gut reaction to a, against a, something that has now twice in the past two decades gone against the popular vote. It just seems wrong. It'll be more difficult to deal with things like first-past-the-post elections, but I think that if we end up having enough bad results that people start thinking about it. Uh, Referenda, I don't know what to do. I mean, I think for referenda you're going to need to, uh, well, first of all, limit on what you do referenda. I mean, this is, and, and then maybe offer more than one choice not make them binary choices because it's I mean you're just saying you know here I am I'm vulnerable you know use whatever you want and uh, and, that, and that is something we can't allow and of course there's a hugely asymmetric relationship with the people doing this because they're not democracies I mean if, if you're you're dealing with a with an undemocratic country you're not going to affect them this way uh, and so you have to think of other ways. I mean, you have to basically harden your defenses. But I do keep thinking that basically we are this digital era that we're in is as fundamental a change as, say, the invention of the printing press. And yet, so this era is something that's actually fundamentally new. Is that sort of your sense? I would actually claim the digital era began in 2006, 2007. With social media in the form of Facebook, mainly then, and the smartphone coming out, and the decision to take social media from the PC to the phone, which led to like this incredible hockey stick of a graph and just like took off. And the sort of ubiquity of the smartphone and the ability to monitor things, uh, which previously were not puts us in a new era. So I'd say I'd say it's 12 years old. Maybe. Wait, do you have a name for it? Well, I call it the digital era. Okay. I mean, as opposed to the Gutenberg era yeah. or the so automobile era. It didn't really happen until it became personal, is your point. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have computers, and I was, you know, I'm one of these, I learned to code 50 years ago. I mean, basic, I admit, but not for, basic is very basic, but it didn't become this ubiquitous worldwide phenomenon until the smartphone came with all of the data that can be accessed and um, 
uh, Stuart Russell, who's an AI scientist, yeah. articulated this mechanism for driving people in different extremes that was not very sophisticated. It was chilling in its simplicity. It was an artifact, he argued, of the system that the social media companies have created to create engagement, which causes a feedback loop which moves people in a direction toward an extreme. Yeah. And he said, you know, it's 50 lines of code. And it wasn't the intent, but it's basically it rewires people politically and moves them incrementally in the direction of the I know him. And he's I his, And I have his, he's down in my the, other office, he, I have his book. He's been also worried about uh, weapons. weapons. He's big on weapons, yeah. yeah. It's one of those mechanisms that we have to develop resilience against via our democratic electoral procedures. Yeah. So, you know, I was, this digital identity question, I was just absolutely startled to see the extent of the Facebook challenge with fraudulent identity. They acknowledged that they, in the last quarter, took out three quarters of a billion fake accounts. Yeah. That, that means to me that they don't have their hands on the problem. If there are that many accounts being created, there's got to be an economic, something's at work that's making a lot of money or something else. Well, they go to a billion, that's, that's like 20% of their... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's staggering. That's what they acknowledge. Well, I mean, since it's all borderless, it's tough. Have you had the opportunity to engage people from Facebook? I'm looking at particularly the Facebook quadrant of this problem that you're working well, on. Well, I've talked to them with some you know, mixed results. One of the problems was, I think there was a, there was a case of real denial. And you know, some of it may be purposeful, but some of it just like, we couldn't. You know, we're the good guys. We're connecting the world. We can't be doing these bad things. I mean, this gets into a whole other problem, uh, which I think is um, one of the things I should be, I'm trying to write, or should be writing, yeah. which is on the 60th anniversary of uh, C.P. Snow's classic article, The Two Cultures, which was about basically the university when it was, when it was published in 1959, and which is like the science people couldn't care less about the humanities people, and the humanities people really didn't understand a thing about what the science people were doing. Well now, I mean, when he wrote the essay, technology did not impinge upon our lives. I mean, you could watch television, yeah. but it couldn't watch you. And your telephone was plugged in the wall, and if you left the room, it didn't know where you are. Whereas, you know, I mean, yeah. just reading again today about how someone steps into a store and, you know, a couple of hours later starts getting ads from that store, right? Just, this yeah. whole surveillance thing is going to be, I think, a... Uh, Zuboff calls it surveillance capitalism. Yes, I know. Here it is. I mean, well, I think basically this is the difference between Silicon Valley and China is that both track everything you do, but one of them feeds it into the government and the other one doesn't. But in terms of tracking you, I'm not sure it's that different uh, in terms of basically spying on what you're doing in one society, there's a there are political consequences for doing things, and with the social credit Criticism. systems coming in, fairly dire ones. But in terms of the surveillance side of stuff, I mean, they're both very good at it. I mean, there are too many cases of manipulation of that were not possible before. I mean, if you look, go back to the pre-digital era. I mean, okay, you didn't have dark ads. You, I mean, if you had an, everyone saw the same ads because they were broadcast, and if something was kind of fishy, you would immediately have an outcry about, you know, this is immoral, but, you know, it's sort of, what is that? Willie Horton. Willie Horton, yeah. Willie Horton and the Swift Brothers were early examples of right. broadcast disinformation. Yeah, but that, I mean, but they also met with, you know, sort of public approval. Yeah, now you don't uh, even see it. You don't know. You don't know anything about it. And so, I mean, that's an example of the kinds of things we face today. Psychologically, you know, I think that fake news gets spread seven times more than real news. Because yeah. real news is boring. It's boring. I mean, this is like the man bites dog, dog, dog bites man. I mean, you know, a, a position paper by, you know, a reasonable candidate. Yeah, who's going to read that? Where will you come down with respect to C.P. Snow? What do you want to add to that? 
Well, I mean, yeah, on CBS now, it's, it's, I mean, really come down on both sides, which is that, uh, I mean, looking at the performance of the various parliamentary bodies that have investigated this, I mean, both the U.S. Senate, but also the British Parliament and the EU, uh, we really need to up the level of basic science knowledge on the part of our legislators in the current era. Yeah. It just doesn't, I mean, I, I mean, my personal story was when I, uh, I gave a, I went to give a talk at the European Parliament in 2014, when I went to introduce what, sort of, for the first time, Estonia's plan for its presidency, which was to create a digital single market, because in Europe, you have a single market for goods and basic services, but when it comes to digital services, it doesn't exist, which... Um, but anyways, I went to give this talk, and there were about 40 members of parliament there listening, strictly voluntary. And so, just to sort of make my point, I pull out my iPhone, and I said, well, this is... You all have one of these, everyone have one of these. And I said, well, you know, Moore's Law says the power of a chip doubles every year and a half. Your next election is in four and a half years. That's three iterations of Moore's Law. That means that this thing will probably look the same, but it'll be two to the third times more powerful. And from the audience, I heard, what is two to the third? <laughs> All right, so this is, and we're talking about a self-selected group of people interested in technology. So that's on the one side, that, and, or you can just look at the, you know, the hearings that took place in the Senate, Facebook hearings? Yeah. 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 On the other hand, you know, as all the things that are coming out in the past two years about surveillance, about uh, selling, well, the whole Cam- Cambridge Analytica debacle, the unwillingness to think about the ethical implications of what you are doing to make a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money yeah. uh, is appalling. And so that, that, that spread of that technology to the basically the yeah. developed world over a very very compressed right. time frame happened in the space of a decade. Uh, you come here, um, you know, if you, let's say if you had been living in Europe and you come to Silicon Valley where these companies are headquartered, did anything strike you? I mean, had the world caught up? Did this seem culturally different in any meaningful way? Uh, many. Well, the first thing that strikes me and strikes me every time I come back from Europe is how, is the, how could this be... I mean, Palo Alto is a town with not one, but two Tesla dealerships, two Apple stores, and, you know, even in, uh, you know, in formerly communist Eastern Europe, you don't drive on roads as bad as the ones here. So So that already says something, there must be some, something's kind of odd. And then when you find out, as I found unfortunately out very quickly, the rents that you pay to live here with bad roads, <laughs> you just go, yeah. "Why is this possible?" Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I was just in Estonia again, and I was like, "It's it, we were we were a commie country, and now it's you know the roads are wonderful, and, and it's not just in the cities. I drive around, and you know everything works." So, is there a cultural commitment to infrastructure that we lack in this country? I'm, I'm thinking about this in the context of the fact that all of a sudden the debate in America is about this thing called socialism, whatever that is. But well, whatever. I don't know what they're... I mean, we're, we, Estonia has not had a... I mean, Estonia has had uh, coalitions that have included the Social Democrats, but, I mean, we're far to the right of even the United States in I many see. ways on economic policy. In my country, I mean, people say, well, how do people trust the government? Well, they don't think of it as government. They think of it as what the state is, whereas those jerks that are in <laughs> the prime minister and those ministers, like, they're... Uh, but this thing works, right? This is just, but anyway, yes, there are huge differences, and that has to do... This is where, for me, the kind of thing that really strikes me is, you know, sitting here and you realize that in a 12-mile radius, you have the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook... Palantir, and probably a whole bunch of other billion-dollar companies. And they do wonderful things. What all of the, I mean, all the things that they have enabled really are fantastic. You know, Hewlett Packard, plus all the financing over on Sand Hill Road, great. 
On the other hand, people spend a day, two, three, at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, what explains our culture? Do you have any idea why we have this cultural or cultural technical inertia? Because you guys, I mean, you guys were behind us at one point, but it wasn't like, is it one of those things where because you didn't have the wired infrastructure, you could jump to the wireless infrastructure more quickly, or is it something else? Well, I mean, in our case, I think it's political will because we're far ahead of, I mean, <laughs> Europe as well. So that comes to vision and leadership. Somebody actually yeah. said the path goes this way. And... Yeah, well, I mean, as, yeah, I, I, I said that 25 years ago and I was belittled and, and laughed at for at least, <laughs> at least well, seven of those years. So that was, um, I mean, that's different. No, but I, I, you don't have to get, I mean, you don't have to be my country, which is... I mean, it's such an outlier. Um, and if people listening want to read about it, I would look at the December 17th, 2017 New Yorker piece called Estonia, the Digital Republic, which is probably the best written thing about it, and written by someone who was a skeptic, went there, came back, and was... Uh, but what is it? Well, first of all, lack of attention paid to infrastructure of any kind for, I don't know, since... For 30 years, 35 years, uh, lack of attention to public services that can be made so much easier and better in a digital era, and sort of clumsy, uh, not very well thought out solutions for those things that are digitized. And so now you're you're involved in various projects on campus that are responses, um, like the Spogman Institute has a group. And are, are I'm you... involved in so many things, I can barely keep <laughs> track of them. But okay, there's the project here at Stanford, which is only beginning about how do we address these issues. Main, it's more focused on the United States, but I'm on the on the chapter eight of it, which deals with which my sort of constant line for the past several years which is that we need very strong international cooperation. And the line of argument there is that basically you have you know, 28 countries in Europe, plus Canada and the United States. All of those countries, there's not a single country that has not been subject to one kind of attack or another. Uh, some more, some less, uh, but it's clear that they all have been subjected to some kind of attack. What kind of cooperation do we have? Zero. Yeah. I mean, it's... So you have to build new structures. Yes. I think what you need is uh, either using existing structures, which would, in one case would be NATO, but NATO is loath to do these. They have a center for cyber in Estonia and a center for strategic communication dealing with propaganda in uh, Latvia. But... Uh, they're limited in their mandates. That is, they will address issues if the O in NATO, the organization, is attacked. So they'll do brilliant work on, say, disinformation about NATO in the Baltic countries. But there are all kinds of other kinds of disinformation which which comes out, which may be a, a sort of targeting a NATO ally but because it's not specifically against NATO, then it's not within the mandate. In the European Union, the response has been uh, pitiful. And I wouldn't say the U.S. has been much better, in that most of the work that you see done today on dealing with the range of these activities, from bots to disinformation, fake news, is done by NGOs. Uh, some of them are very good NGOs. I mean, probably uh, DFR Lab at the Atlantic Council and Bellingcat are superb. And in fact, uh, Bellingcat probably, I mean, open source intelligence is a whole new game after Bellingcat. Before that, people yeah. weren't be doing that. But if you look at it, you see, and you have all of these organizations that are doing it, whereas governments are doing almost nothing. And uh, you also see that at least some governments, uh, won't mention any, but don't even want to address the issue. Uh, though you might say that where the attack, the approach to destabilizing, interfering, whatever you want to call it, was successful, the winner of that result is clearly not interested in pursuing this. So 
uh, I mean, not only in the U.S., but also in the U.K., you, do, uh, you really see this, there's this huge reticence even to, to address the issue. And in fact, basically, the newspaper, The Guardian, uh, and one journalist, uh, Carol Callowater, who's done all the work, exposing how much of this dirty stuff was going on. And okay, there's a parliamentary committee that came out with a report last week after two years after Brexit. And same thing in the United States. There was, instead of boosting and financing more of this, a, 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 sort of at the government level, you had the White House sort of got rid of its cyber department, now it's back. The State Department dismantled its anti-cyber associated unit, and, uh, and now I guess they're reestablishing it. Whereas in other France, on the other hand, seems to where in fact also faced a rather brutal attack in terms of uh, hacking the, the servers of the of uh, Emmanuel Macron um, came out very tough because it didn't win, they didn't win. Whereas I imagine if Marine Le Pen had won, there would have been oh no nothing. <laughs> So why do you think governments are slow or hesitant to take the reins of some of these issues? I think a lack of knowledge. I mean, if you, I mean, that's why I mentioned this case about you know what's two to the third. Right, right. I mean, it's across the world. Basically, your people in government have not really, or in policy making decisions. You have a lot of people who are smart in government, but they're not making policy. They may understand, but they're not. You know, they're not in Congress or in Parliament, and they're rarely in, in ministers or secretaries. Um, occasionally they are, but... So they don't understand the full extent of the threat. And I think the, in the Obama administration, there were people who did, but even there you saw no... Uh, you, you didn't see a willingness to actually take major steps in that regard. Yeah. And that was, you know, that's coming out now. And even there, from what I understand from talking to people, that they were worried about Russian meddling, but not of the kind and of the extent that has become clear. Uh, and now there seems to be a complete lack of interest in pursuing these issues at all. If someone came to you and, and waved a magic wand and you got unlimited staff and budget, what would you get to work on right away? What initiatives? What would you start? I would actually digitize a state in the United States and make it work. And then every other state would see, oh, it works. I mean, you save huge amounts of money. Estonia saves basically 2% of GDP or gets 2% of GDP from simply the time savings. And then uh, that's... Which you, I would do. I mean, just because I'd done it, and I think it would be so cool for someone, someone in the U.S. to do it, which would like be transformative. If the U.S. does it, and Silicon Valley sees it, then it would, I think that would be a hugely beneficial thing. Yes. Have you thought about what the first state? What, what is there an ideal state? Well, you need. A, I would say North Dakota yeah. or something where it's easy to manageable. Right. I mean, just because it has to be small in the beginning, because. I mean, people say, well, what Estonia did, you're a small country, it's not scalable. Technologically, there's no problem. But what is difficult to scale is political will. You find that in small societies, smaller countries, um, you kind of can get to a consensus to do something. And, and so the countries that have adopted this all have all been smaller countries. Tomas, thanks for chatting with us today. And for our listeners, take a look at the show notes for this episode for links to some of the topics and organizations we've discussed.